again, good morning, St. James Church. It's been way too long since I've been here. You gotta talk to Ben and tell him to leave here more often. <laughs> Make some room at the top. As always, it's a blessing to be here with you. And uh, a lot has transpired in, in the three years that I've been gone. But it's really great to see old friends and really great to see some new faces also. Um, I come to you this morning wondering if you are like me. Have you had your fill of the political <laughs> conferences and all of the stuff, the advertisements, everything that goes along with that. I mean, I'm absolutely full of that kind of stuff. And I think that WikiLeaks has had way more impact on my life than I would like for it to have had. <laughs> Let me bring you a word that I wish that I had heard or read on WikiLeaks. It seems like the information is gathered secretively and kept somewhere and then divulged. It, that has a greater credibility than the message that is available to us day in and day out in the media. What I wish I had heard and read on WikiLeaks is this. Jesus Christ is Lord. Without permission, without exception, without agreement, Jesus Christ is Lord. And that being true, that means that Hillary and Donald are not nor are we. We have trouble talking ourselves out of that from time to time. I understand. But when we get our minds wrapped around the truth of who God is and what he is doing in our lives, then that changes our perception over our present and our future. Our trouble is we have trouble admitting to ourselves that we are not God, that we are not in control. So much of our lives is consumed in accomplishments and acquisitions. I think that I could have served as a poster child for this parable at one time in my life. The stuff that we have that we accumulate. Let me ask you about how important that is to you. It's important in that we, we leave it. We want somehow to leave a legacy, do we not? We want the people to come behind us saying, well, these folks exceeded the norm. They were better than average. Uh, look what fine stuff they left. And um, it seems to be that we leave enough stuff so that our loved ones will have to fight over it to divide it and then deliver it to Goodwill or to the yard sales or to wherever, wherever it goes because that's where most of the stuff ends up. Look at the gospel today, this parable of the rich fool. Teacher. Teacher. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. When I read these words, I was filled with sadness because my experience is that so many of us reside there. We are only interested in getting stuff. We are interested in the division of whomever went before us. What are they leaving us? 
And the bottom line is for all of us, how can we get something for relatively nothing? We all live there. We live there. And our stuff is important to us because it's the sum and substance of who we are. It represents the wealth accumulated over whatever that is. Uh, some things passed on out of my generation. I can reach back through the Great Depression and uh, uh, real poverty uh, from southwestern Virginia. Find stuff in my house that represents all of that stuff to me. And yet when I die, I know exactly where it's going to go. <laughs> Nobody in my family cares about that. So the question for us is, how important should it be to us? If Jesus is Lord, I wish I'd heard those messages. I wish I'd heard those words. Jesus is Lord, this does not matter. <coughs> what freedom there is in that realization. We get our identification from our stuff, but it's the wrong place to get identification. We need to get it from Jesus because the stuff has no value except that it reflect the grace of God through our Lord Jesus coming to us. We think about the things that have been passed down to us, the things that count, values passed down by our parents, patriarchs and matriarchs, the morals and the um, ethics passed on to us, important to us. But Jesus is Lord. And as these things reflect Christ in our lives, then they take on the importance. Then Jesus tells us this parable. He said, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. Isn't that wonderful? Whose land was it? Did that man make the land? Who created the conditions that caused the crop to grow? You see, it was not the man, but he was very quick to lay claim because it gave him a life of ease. It gave him something for relatively nothing. Eat, drink, and be merry. I've got enough money and cash flow to last me for several years. It's all that I need to be happy. And he saw himself in control of his life. And that, dear hearts, is the crux of our problem. We see ourselves in control. Hello? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and he is the one who is in control. All that you have, all that you are, all that you will be, everything is a gift from God, the grace from God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not a relative statement. It's not true for me and not true for you. Because relative truth is no truth at all. This is the way it is. I report, you decide. <clears throat> but the proof of the pudding is that when you leave here, there's going to be a void left by your leaving, not by the stuff that you take with you. What's going to leave here with you is the the things are the things that are truly yours, that God has given you. You are unique. Every one of you in here is unique in Jesus Christ. You are the only person to have ever lived with your DNA, with your smile, with your personality, with your gifts, with your abilities. All of these are God given to you. They are imperishable. <coughs> we do not.
not give to God the perishable. We give to God the imperishable. The stuff stays here. The imperishable goes with us. We've talked a lot in here in this context about having an attitude of gratitude. I've been beating that for a long time. And Jesus tells us about the rich man. He says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself and is not rich toward God. How are you rich toward God? How can you be rich toward God? How many of you have had someone in the nursing home, an elderly aunt or uncle or maybe a parent, but they're there and they are, they're just there and it's Christmas time and you have to generate a gift for them. And how long do you anguish over what on earth can you give this person who needs absolutely nothing that is meaningful? Think about God. He doesn't need your money. He certainly doesn't need your stuff. He needs the imperishable. Paul, Paul talks to us about this. You see, at our conception, I want you to think about this now. At our conception, there is a certain amount of God's glory that is given to each one of us. Because we are created in his image and we are charged with the responsibility of reflecting him in our lives. Therefore, we must have a certain degree of the glory of God in each one of us. Now, this is what Paul says, and you're familiar with the passage, passage from uh, Philippians chapter 2, with the verse, uh, fifth verse. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to, to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How do we be rich toward God. You give him the glory. You proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. You relinquish all of yourself to God. That's all you have to give him. And that's all he really seems to want. Be rich toward God. Give him the glory. He has given that to you to share with him. Amen.